Welcome to I Drink Your Podcast. Oh gosh, it's it's a real pleasure to be here. Thank you. You leave me no choice. It comes the smolder. Wait, you like that? No. I don't like that. No, I don't like that. No, how about that? You like that? Uh, a little better. Bread makes you fat. Does this count as annoying? Just tell me what you want me to fuck. Not you. Not you. And not you. Okay, I think it's time to take off your clothes and jump me. A million dollars isn't cool. You know what's cool? I drink your podcast. I drink it up. Welcome to I Drink Your Podcast. I'm Emily, and we have some fantastic guests with us today. Ben is here as always. Yeah, not so fantastic, but I'm back. Mostly fantastic. We also have our horror and thriller expert, Dylan. Good to be back, but I I wouldn't go as far to say expert. I'd say enthusiast. Mm, More expert than me, so very expertise. (laughs) Is that the bar? I guess so. (laughs) We also have a very special guest, Simon Thompson, who is a journalist and critic. Welcome, Simon. Thank you. I was going to say, obviously, the bar is set very low if this is exciting, but uh, I'll take it. So thank you. It, it's very exciting. It is. It, we're we're really excited. I appreciate you guys having me on. I think you're our first like official check mark on Twitter, and we're like, yeah, really, <laughs> hell yeah. Well, it can only go up from here. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Before we talk about our movie, I just wanted to plug for those ratings on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. Please send us some love. Because Ben puts a lot of work into making us sound good, and we'd really <laughs> like his work to be showed off, even though we make everything a mess. So, anyway, this episode we watched Buried, which is found on HBO Max if you want to watch it. Yeah, get it. Which I don't have HBO Max, so. Woo! Yeah, yeah, get it. <laughs> you should really get it. <laughs> Maybe. I'll see. I do. I love HBO Max. There's just so many streaming services, and I don't have the money for that shit. So, anyway, we have some very special drinks, I think, in our glasses, right, Dylan? Hey, no, don't, no, I don't. Uh, you know where I'm going. Shit, Dylan, what'd you, what'd you bring? Oh, I went, I went full on like a uh, silly imperialist American with a nice white claw that I'm going with. That's that's. Oh. It's bad. I don't know why. Tie it in. Tie it, Tie in, it in. That's that's All pretty right. close, though. Well, yeah. The uh, well, you know, we have uh, a man who is potentially wrongfully imprisoned in a box for just being a uh, silly American coming into a country and trying to fix things. So why not drink one of the frou frouiest American things ever? A black <laughs> cherry white claw. Oh, see, I thought you were going to go with like the basic Matt description of it's a white guy clawing his way out of a box. So, no, but I try I to like go slightly higher brow. It's <laughs> <laughs> fine. Ben, what are you drinking tonight? Yeah, I went with a uh, Ryan Reynolds themed drink tonight. So I went out and bought myself a bottle of aviation gin, which is the, the gin that he uh, owns and hawks. And oh, my gosh. I, also threw in a little mint with it because of uh, his sponsorship of Mint Mobile. So I'm all about Ryan Reynolds tonight. I got a gin and tonic with mint and lime. Mm. Whatever, Ben. On brand. <laughs> Can't quite hear you there, Ben. You're gar- with you gargling some uh, Ryan Reynolds in your mouth there. Hey, if it presents itself, I would. I'm not gonna. <laughs> I'm not gonna turn that away. If you're listening, Ryan, come on. I'll do it. Simon, please tell me you have something better than that. <laughs> Well, actually, staying on the uh, the Ryan Reynolds theme, uh, I actually have a, a glass of Ryan Reynolds bath water. Um, just to get no, I'm, no, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I just wanted to see if I could get even closer he's, to Ryan he's Reynolds. He's selling that now. Yeah, I mean, why not? I mean, look, he's selling mobile phones. He's selling gin. He's selling everything. No, I've um, I, I've I've made myself some tea, as you can tell from my ridiculous accent. Um, I, I drink a lot of tea, uh, and it's actually darker than being trapped in a box. <laughs> yeah. So uh, that's how I like my tea. Um, there you go. Never been in a box, so I don't know how dark it is, but having watched Buried, um, pretty dark. 
I'm probably darker than what would come out of my pants, actually, when uh, if I was trapped in a box. <laughs> that would be that'd be pretty dark and brown and wet too. So uh, yeah, nice. Um, how about you? I am drinking what I'm calling a last meal slash buried in sand milkshake because I really felt like Paul, our main character, needed something real tasty at the end there. And also, there's a lot of sand, so I needed something kind of yellowish. So I have a banana and mango milkshake, and I'm very proud of it because it's oh, delicious. That does sound really good, actually. Yeah, jealous much? <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, Simon, thank you so much for joining us here today. Thank you. That's absolutely my pleasure. I, uh, I, I came for the movie and stayed for the milkshake. Um, yes, I, yeah. You know, brought all the boys to the yard as, uh, as milkshakes go. traditionally do. <laughs> so, yeah. Well, Simon, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Um, well, my name is Simon Thompson. I, uh, uh, what do I do? I, bas- I basically have conversations with people um, that have way more money and are far more successful and creative than I am for a living. <laughs> um, and then... That either appears uh, in an article or on television. Um, so as a journalist and critic, I, I write for Variety and Forbes and IGN and a, a few other websites, anyone that will pay me, basically. Um, and then I've made uh, made a few TV shows in my time as well. Um, none of it's going to go down in history, but, uh, you know, shits and giggles. And uh, it's managed to keep food in my belly and a roof over my head by just being a nonsense and a massive nerd. So... Um... <laughs> That's, that's basically my life. Um, yeah. yeah. Well, with being a nerd, and it sounds like a, a, a movie nerd at that, what is the movie that made you fall in love with film? Well, it's funny. I, 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 wrote, I, was, I was trying to tie it down to one, and I think it's actually a handful um, that kind of combined, kind of made me a massive fan of movies. Um, this is going to sound really wanky, but it's <laughs> Metropolis. Um, the, yep. the classic black and white German sci-fi movie. Um, you know, if, even for the uninitiated, a lot of people go, oh, 1920s German cinema, Simon. Fantastic. Please leave. Um, but it's actually brilliant. <laughs> and if, the, if you think that that is not accessible, then there is an 80s version which was colorized and had people like Queen and, and uh, loads of 80s acts doing music for it. So if you want sci-fi, but like 80s and camp, then you can watch the colorized version. Uh, yeah, I know. Emily's going to be very excited about <laughs> this. Oh my gosh, this. I'm so excited Did about you not this. Know this, this is 100%. <laughs> okay, Simon, you don't know a lot about me, but I do not watch a lot of movies. <laughs> okay, well, you would you would love this. It's kind of like it, it's like, you know, a classic German sci-fi movie from the 1920s had sex with Streets of Fire. Um, which again, <laughs> probably wouldn't mean a huge amount to you. You're like, brilliant, something, something, sci-fi and sex. Um, uh, but then other movies, I probably Dawn, uh, Dawn of the Dead, which I absolutely love. Um, here's the thing. I was, I was talking to you guys before this about this penchant that I have for, uh, that's French for a penchant, um, of uh, watching videos at late night, staying up late night and drinking and, and watching YouTube's on video. And I love watching videos of abandoned moles um, and I think that all comes mm. from the fact that I love Dawn of the Dead, um, which is great. So anyway, I'm sad. Um, but I also <laughs> love, um, I'm, I'm sad and tragic and I'm going to die alone. Um, but also The Breakfast Club is a big, a big movie that I love. Uh, anything John Hughes, um, obviously, you know, before he died. Um, and then uh, E.T., uh, big fan of E.T., which is fantastic. You know, you always and ben still, both. still makes me cry. Still get me right yeah. in the feels, mm-hmm. you know. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Ben, you still cry at that one too? I do still cry at that one, yeah. Yeah. I was actually going to tell a quick story. I actually worked at the uh, movie theater when they did the big re release uh, of E.T. with uh, you know, the walkie talkies instead of guns and all that weirdness that they tried to do with it. And yeah, when that scene of them going, the, the, the bike and the moon and all, I was just balding like a baby. And I, I was like, there's no way this movie can uh, can still get me. And I'm like, oh, my God, it's getting me again. Yeah, it, it, it continues to, to, to get me. And also, I mean, probably Back to the Future is finally the, the last one, which just to show how sad I am, um, when I have friends come to visit me in L.A., whether they want to or not, I take them on like a driving tour of the city to show them all the spots from uh, from Back to the Future. So um, I get a lot less visitors <laughs> these days. 
and it's not due to COVID. <laughs> it's not due to COVID. It's the fact that I'm a tragic old fuck um, who does that with my spare time. But yeah, so there we go. Uh, I apologize. Well, Simon, I got to ask, with you being just a legit critic, our first one really on this show, I got to ask, Hook, underrated classic or greatest movie ever made? Uh, well, I'm, I'm actually, do you know what? I have, I have love for Hook. <laughs> I, there, there's a lot of movies that a lot of people throw shit at, like Monkeys in a Zoo. And, uh, uh, you know, Hook is one of those. Toys is another one for me. Um, you know, the Robin Williams movie, uh, Toys, that I love. There's a... There's a load of these movies that I that I you know take a lot of shit and I absolutely love and uh, and that's on there. Dick Tracy is another one, but no. Hook, oh yeah. In answer to your question, if I could, if I could just shut up for a minute, um, is <laughs> is genius. Perfect, L- love it. Well, that that'll do it for this episode. We're gonna get out of here now, and <laughs> I've, 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 I've got the validation I'm looking for. And now 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 Ben, let me ask. Uh, uh, let, let's get his real thing. John Carpenter's Escape from New York. Oh, amazing or horrible uh amazing yes but i'm also a fan of escape from la and i i had the absolute pleasure of talking to john carpenter very recently oh which was absolutely incredible i love the man but he is basically you only have a conversation with john carpenter great to talk about his movies but he genuinely gives the impression that he would rather be anywhere else than talking to you <laughs> <laughs> like getting blood out of a stone but stones are like don't give us a bad rep um actually we bleed a lot by comparison lovely man absolute genius miserable as fucking sin um but still a pleasure so. awesome that's awesome well you had one good opinion and one bad opinion so we'll move on from there and um, <laughs> simon why don't you sell us on something you've watched recently well, I, there's a couple of movies that I, I, I watched recently that I, I, I quite enjoyed. The Batman, might have heard that. Um, that's out I'm this so week. I'm so excited. It's good, um, but it's not perfect. But I did enjoy it. That's fine. Um, I'm, I was a big fan of Come On, Come On, uh, Mike Mills' movie, um, his most recent movie, which I absolutely loved. Um, and obviously because it's been awards season, um, which appears to never end now. Um, it's, uh, yeah, it's cinema COVID. Um, it never ends. Um, uh, I, I also watched uh, Mass, which I really, really loved, oh, and I'm kind of disappointed that Mass is not really getting really good things. Yeah, more more love than it. You know, it's it's been getting this award season because there were some phenomenal performances in that, and the director Fran Krantz did an amazing job. Um, you know, he's got a brilliant future ahead of him uh, in cinema. Um, and then I've just watched some of the same old shit that I'll usually watch over and over again. Yes, you know, as I as I try to 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 kill my internal pain. <laughs> well, I mean, I totally do the same thing. My sister and I literally just finished up Muppet Treasure Island again, and it was a fantastic time. <laughs> well, m- moving from Muppet Buried Treasure to this movie Buried that we just watched, Simon, you you asked specifically to be on for for this movie. Uh, why why this movie? Um, it's a movie that a lot of people didn't see, um, and I, I genuinely thought it was really great, and I was. I wanted to revisit it because I, I saw it. Uh, I used to live in London, as you can tell from my ridiculous accent. Um, you know, I lived and worked. I grew up in the UK. Um, everybody thinks whatever I say here is intelligent. Evidently, that's not true. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> obviously, I'm talking just bollocks. Um, and I actually worked on this movie when I was working for a production company I- in London. Oh, we did a lot of editorial mm. tied into this to promote the movie. So I got you know pretty uh, pretty down in. Uh, in Ryan's box um, on this one. Um, oh, you're so lucky. I mean, I, damn. Well, it also because, I mean, I wanted to see whether this movie really worked at home. Damn, Ryan's box. <laughs> <laughs> and I, want, I wanted to see if it worked at home because I hadn't watched it since I actually did, did a lot of stuff with, with Ryan and the director on this. Um, because I remember it was a really tight, really sweet 90s, you know, 90 sort of minute, you know, give or take, um, you know, Hitchcockian kind of thing. And I hadn't watched it outside of a outside of a movie theater or, or a screening room where obviously you have a great screen and you have the you know the the special sound and stuff like that. I wanted to see if it held up. And I'll be honest with you, um, everything I remember about it still holds up. And I actually saw some things in it that I kind of didn't see last time. So it was actually really fun to to revisit this. It's also one of the movies that people forget that Ryan made. It was at a really weird point in his career where yeah. he was trying to transition from just being this 
you know, uncomfortably attractive um, romantic comedy guy to try and do something that was not just to, to make people moist, to be honest with you. And, um, <laughs> and, and he kind of didn't know what to do. So for some reason, he was like, I'll get in a box. And um, I mean, it fucking worked, but nobody saw it. So, um, yeah, well done, Ryan, I guess. Yeah. Well, even though nobody saw it, it currently sits at an 87% on Rotten Tomatoes. So that's why we're doing this movie, mostly because we're focusing on 2010 best-ish movies. And it was also one of the National Board of Review's top 10 independent movies of 2010. It made $21 million on a $2 million budget. It's not bad, right? No, that's, that's really good. And this is no, directed yeah, no, by no. Rodrigo Cortez who also served as the film's editor. He mostly did short films before his feature debut, which was a 2007 film called The Contestant. And this movie features mainly just one performance, and so the starring section is going to be short. It's got Ryan Reynolds, who is a very famous actor. <laughs> Career highlights up until 2010 were probably Waiting, Just Friends, and pr pretty much the preeminent version of Deadpool in X-Men Origins Wolverine. <laughs> And then right after this, he did Green Lantern. Awkward. Yep. <laughs> oh. Yes, 911. I'm buried in a coffin in the ground. You have to help me. You have to help me. I can't breathe. How did you end up in the coffin, sir? My convoy was ambushed. They got hit in the head. I blacked out, and that's the last thing I remember. Well, this was another movie that Emily and I both have not seen before, so really all Emily had to work with to come up with her synopsis is Buried and Ryan Reynolds. So, Emily, what did you think this movie was going to be about? Yeah, I went a direction I think uh, is going to shock some of you, I think. Ooh, this <laughs> so. is going to be good. Uh, don't, don't build it up that much. It'll be fine. <laughs> so here's what I was picturing. A very dead Ryan Reynolds is buried in a cemetery after some sort of tragic death, right? However, after some time, a small tree begins to grow over his grave, and strange little buds begin to appear. This curious tree is growing an army of tiny, cloned Ryan Reynolds to go on a mission to avenge his original body's death by creating the most elaborate killing spree. It's not far off. It's, no. <laughs> it's really, really not. <laughs> that sounds like a really good 90s Tales from the Crypt episode. I can see why just the Thank word you. buried would make you think clone tree. <laughs> yeah. Obvious connection there. Well, I was trying to think something weird because Ryan Reynolds does weird shit now. I mean, not really, but kind of. I don't know. I thought Free Guy was weird. So <laughs> that was where I went. And yes, Emily, that is a compliment because HBO's Tales from the Crypt from the 90s was amazing. That was a great show. But also, Ryan, you're, you're not far off because Ryan has done some weird movies. I mean, there's the change-up where he pissed in a fountain with Jason Bateman and they swap mm -hmm. bodies. I mean, that's True. not a documentary in case anybody's wanting to explore Ryan's back catalogue. <laughs> not a documentary. Uh, not based on real events, um, you know. Uh, there's, I mean, God, what else did he do? Um, he did some really weird things. He did some couple of things a couple of years after with, like, his head in a fridge. Oh, yeah, yeah. There was the one where he was like a serial killer and his like pets were talking to him. That's the one. Anna, yeah. Anna that Kendrick normal. was the voices. The voices. Yeah. 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 And you know, Deadpool's pretty normal. Yeah. You know. He also was Pikachu. Totally normal. Oh shit, normal. that's right. <laughs> oh, and Detective Pikachu. <laughs> yeah. And he was a snail. Um, oh, that's right. In, Turbo. What was that? Turbo. I was going to call it Tug then, but I think that's a different movie. Don't <laughs> Google Ryan Reynolds movie. and Tug. Don't, don't Google that. <laughs> what if you do, do it on like someone that. else's computer at work, not yours? <laughs> well, Dylan, we've heard Emily's plot synopsis. Let's hear what the DVD cover has to say. All right. Paul Conroy is not ready to die, but when he wakes up six feet underground with no idea who put him there or why, Life for the truck driver and family man instantly becomes a hellish struggle for survival. Buried with only a cell phone and a lighter, his contact with the outside world and ability to piece together clues that would help him discover his location are maddeningly limited. 
Poor reception, a rapidly draining battery, and a dwindling oxygen supply become his worst enemies in a tightly confined race against time. Fighting panic, despair, and delirium, Paul has only 90 minutes to be rescued before his worst nightmare comes true. It's like the whole fucking movie. <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry. I was going to say, it's full of spoilers, that, isn't it? <laughs> right. And it's not even all correct. That's true. <laughs> he has a lot more shit in his box. Yeah. Lucky. Well, Simon, you saw this movie, obviously, because you were a part of a lot, which is really cool. And Ben and I hadn't seen this, but Dylan, knowing you and your love for thrillers and stuff, had you seen this movie before? No, I had never seen really? this one either. This is this was the first time watching it for me. It totally seems like your jam. You know, it was. And I think what happened was it just came and went so fast from the theaters. I can't remember. It, it came out in 2010, and that's the year I got married. So it could have been out while, you know, we were planning everything, and it was just busy, 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 so we just missed it. Okay. Well, then, I would love to hear everyone's first thoughts. Well, Simon, we'll save you for the end, because we hadn't seen it before. <laughs> I, I didn't get this one, guys. I didn't get it. Really? This is not a movie for me. There was a lot of stuff that just had me questioning when I was watching. I didn't I didn't feel like the plot of it had enough to drive even a 90 minute movie. Like I would have much rather seen this in like a 30 minute short film. I think that would have been a much, much more engaging watch. But I this one didn't work for me. I'm just gonna leave it at that because we'll talk about a lot more of it later. Okay, Dylan, what were your first thoughts? was very mixed when it when uh, as as it kept going um but in the end I did enjoy it I think there's a few things that we'll talk about later that I think they could change that I think would have made it a lot better but um no I thought you know mixed reactions at first but then uh, once it started kind of rolling uh I enjoyed it I thought it was good M how about you I'm kind of leaning towards Dylan's thoughts right now because there were definitely moments where I was looking at the screen going really (laughs) and maybe that's just my my youth sticking out but I I did in general admire a lot of the decision making and the filmmaking of it so I'm excited to kind of dig into this especially because I was doing some reading and the director was really inspired by Alfred Hitchcock's Mm -hmm. ropes which I nope. rope. Just rope. Sorry. Fine. Just rope. <laughs> yeah, it wasn't the sequel ropes. Just the uh, just the original <laughs> rope. But I would love to hear more from Simon about like what did you do to help out with this movie, and then also just where do you see the inspiration of Alfred Hitchcock in it? Um, well, first of all, I mean, from a from a my involvement in it, it was very much after sort of the film was made, and I I was working for a, um, a production company at the time that was doing a lot of EPK stuff. Um, which is electronic press kit Uh, yeah i was gonna say uh epk sorry i taught it's like when a doctor goes oh it's an ecg what's that it's basically (laughs) a a thing um (laughs) an epk is uh basically when there are generic interviews and clips of movies and stuff like that it's called an electronic press kit um so all the the video clips you see like interviews behind the scenes and stuff they usually come from an epk so i was working on that for the film company so spent a lot of time with Uh, with Ryan doing interviews and with the director kind of dissecting the movie, going through it and laying it out for people who, you know, when you go see me, he's like, what is this movie about? And it's basically that. So a lot of this stuff often ends up on uh, DVD extras and Blu-ray extras and stuff like that. Um, So that's what I was doing. So I spent a lot of time, ironically, in a very small dark space uh, with the director, kind of breaking down what this was. (laughs) Um, It was kind of like, oh, that's very on brand. And I was like, also terrifying. (laughs) Um, And it took about 90 minutes each time we chatted, uh, which was very on brand. Um, So, yeah. So, I mean, when it came to when it came to comparisons with with Alfred Hitchcock, um, it for me, it it does have those comparisons. But it also feels very theatrical because it's very much a the only person you see on screen throughout this is is Ryan Reynolds. And that's also the case that that, that Hitchcock would use in, in a number of his movies where there would be one protagonist that would be the center of everything. And in this case, it was one man in a box. 
um, mm-hmm. where everything else happens around him or to him or because of him. But it really does center on this 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 one particular kind of centerpiece, which is which is Ryan in the box. Um, I mean, there were lots of tricks and lots of. It was really interesting to talk to the director at the time about how he did things. Like, there's a sequence in the movie where Ryan is obviously in this box. He's under the ground. We're told very early on he's six six feet under the ground. And yet there appears to be a very large coffin, effectively. You know, the camera Mm -hmm. pulls up and it gives that sense of space to try and, you know, elevate that. And there are scenes where even within, you know, a very small area, the camera fundamentally does a 360. And it's really kind of giving a very sort of inside, outside you know, keeping it very intimate, but kind of expanding the world, bigger picture kind of filmmaking, which is actually really difficult to get right because you don't want to go, oh, fuck, the box is a lot bigger than you actually think it is. You want to keep that level of of claustrophobia um, and paranoia that, that are really endemic in a lot of, you know, spread right into the DNA of a lot of Hitchcock movies and stuff as well, that that paranoia, that, that you know, the world's closing in on me or something's going to happen to me or I can't control what these things are or trying to get control of something, um, whether it's birds or, you know, uh, anything else in a, in a Hitchcock movie. Uh, Psycho is another great example. Um, so that use of space, that use of intimacy is, is, is very, very Hitchcockian, as well as the kind of that, that line of um, suspense, you know, what, what is going to happen, that, that, you know, the cause and effect kind of thing. And um, are, what you're hearing at the end of the phone, is that really what you're experiencing or is that something that is, not a reality. Am I underground at all? Oh. Am I in, you know, uh, the, the Middle East? Or am I just in a van surrounded by dirt? You know, it's that kind of, you know, thing that Hitchcock would often play with those concepts that would play with your mind. Mm-hmm. That's interesting you say that because there was a tiny moment in my brain that went, mm, maybe this is all a ruse. And he's actually like back in the States. And this is just like a trading thing i don't know i I was just like a split second i'm like "Mm, i have some doubts so it's interesting that you say that because i didn't know that that was kind of like a goal of hitchcock to mess with your brain yeah because you want to play with that reality what is real i mean you know and we know from sort of you know not not to get too serious but we know from sort of torture techniques where you know you want to disorientate someone you want to confuse them about what is the reality of what they're experiencing and where are they located you know, can you make them think that maybe they're here or maybe they're there so they don't know? So all of these things are very sort of, you know, Hitchcockian and kind of espionage and throwing throwing you off for, for Ryan's character as much as the audience will. The other Hitchcockian thing that specifically relates back to Rope is this idea of an isolated time that has a beginning and end and we're not cutting away from that time period. Like he's in this box for 90 minutes. Rope is, is built to be this like uninterrupted shot for the entire movie. So I think that's why the the rope comparison is is so apt for this one in particular is okay. because of that that extended yeah. time thing. I would have been very interested actually to see this done as a one shot. The fact that it isn't, the fact that this is edited, I would have been very interested. Emily's saying no. I I just <laughs> no. Here's where my brain is. I'm th- like thinking about the feasibility of doing something like that because I watched some of the behind the scenes of how they went through and filmed and had different size coffins and they had literally places where they could move the walls of the coffin. And I, I, I'm sitting here like, holy shit, that would have been so hard. Mm-hmm. But if there's, there's actually a British film that came out uh, last year on VOD um, uh, here, here in the States, it was towards the end of the year called uh, Boiling Point which is one night in a restaurant oh, and the whole thing is yeah, one Yeah, I did hear about that one. So, mm-hmm. so good. One of my favorite movies of last year. Um, and basically, it's one night in a London restaurant. And it's again, it's like 90 minutes, but it's all one shot. They only got to film that entire movie three times. Right. I think, actually, one of our good friends that comes on the show quite a bit from a different podcast, I think Lacey was the one that mentioned that one to us. Mm-hmm. So I'll definitely give it a shot. <laughs> now that I have a... F- critic <laughs> well whatever the context is whether you're in a box or in a restaurant it's that it's that you know sort of the the, the pressure you know of, of 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 kind of not knowing you know you're in a very confined environment i think doing this buried movie though in a one shot would have taken away a lot of the stuff that i actually really liked about this movie which is the editing and i think the lighting would have been a lot tougher to try to maneuver with a single shot and a single take like that 
So like the cinematography of this movie, I thought was was very well done, and I thought it was cut very well together to create the sense of claustrophobia, with the exception of those shots that you talked about, Simon, where they're panning up. And you can see like the, the the amount of boards that lie in the coffin. And you're like, oh, I don't like that. I don't like the one where they're pulling away from the side and it's just black space around it. Like I felt like those shots took away from the claustrophobic feel that I would have felt had it stayed localized. Hmm. Yeah, okay. it's it's borderline. Mm-hmm. They really tread a very, very, you know, very sort of fine line with that one. But I, I, I agree with you on that one, Ben. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Dylan, thoughts? Yeah, I thought the uh, cinematography was pretty was pretty damn impressive because how on earth are you going to make a movie about a 90 minute movie about a man stuck in a box and not make it boring to look at? And I thought a lot of especially like, you know, I think we were in for kind of a a nice technical treat uh, when we had the first scene of him kind of getting the lay of the land type of thing. And it was that like 360 shot you know, that went like upside down and around. I was like, okay, this, that that's, that's very intriguing and interesting. And, mm-hmm. and I like the shot where they kind of, where they pull away uh, from him. And uh, I just kind of, I interpreted that as that's him kind of losing his mind a little bit. He was kind of starting to crack under the pressure at that point and was just, you know, not seeing things, everything straight. But uh, yeah, I thought, you know, for, for a 90 minute movie of a man stuck in a wooden box, they did a pretty good job of making that box <laughs> look different and interesting and uh, not boring to watch for the whole 90 minutes. I think also that bearing in mind the first 10 minutes fundamentally is there's no dialogue. Ryan Reynolds yeah. doesn't do anything apart from grunt. And, and a lot of it is just black. You literally don't see anything. And occasionally you'll get a you know, kind of like a little bit of a a light and you'll see his face for a while. But, you know, I think it's about, even with the credits, it's like 10, 20 until Ryan actually says anything. And I think it's like, fuck, something like that. Um, (laughs) You know, I mean, for the fact that I know a lot of people that started watching that movie and were like, what the fuck is this? 10 minutes of a man (laughs) grunting in a box, please don't have a wank. (laughs) You know, it's like, he could be. I mean, you know, we've we've all done, we've all been there. but yeah, I mean, I just, it, 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 that, that's a big risk. That's a really big risk. But one thing I will say that watching it at home is a different experience to watching it in a movie theater because the sound design, even if you have a really good thing, a lot of this movie and a lot of the, the tension actually is part of that sound design. And that doesn't quite come through when you're watching it at home. So there is something I think that is a little bit lost in translation, you know, by seeing it at, you know, at home unless you have a really kick-ass system. Um, or great headphones on um, that I think really adds to the movie. Mm-hmm. Or put yourself in a box. <laughs> I was all in for this movie in that first 10 minutes you were talking about, Simon, where he's not talking. As soon as the cell phone was introduced and we actually have to start listening to his conversations with other people and you're hearing the asinine things that are coming from the other end of, of the phone, like it just started to feel a little, it was too stupid. Her, him talking to the dispatch person, police dispatch, and she's asking these like really silly questions back at him that any trained dispatch person would not ask. Like every conversation he had with somebody was like, they're just dragging out this conversation so that they can hit a 90 minute film. I okay. think it was very bad. little substance. I, I you know, Ben, I'll, I, I would actually kind of agree with that, too, because that was one of the things I was kind of iffy on was I was just like. And I was kind of thinking part partly through it. I was like, so are these terrorists like fucking with him or something? Like, is this phone that when he, these numbers he's calling, are these the real numbers or have they hacked his phone to go to people they're paying off to just sound like this? And then they just don't believe him at all. So and then he's just to make him more frustrated and more angry. But at the same time, yeah, I kind of had that feeling, though, too, where I was like, this guy's telling you he's stuck in a box and you're asking him like, are you sure you're stuck in a box? Did you put yourself in the box? I was like, that's, it was conveniently inconvenient. As a, <laughs> you know, it fit the True. story, but it just, it didn't necessarily fit with real life. True. But to be fair, there are a lot of people on drugs and alcohol that call dispatch. So, you know, like I get it, but also, Counterpoint. 
people yeah. are high as hell and calling 911. Yeah, I was going to say, and, and if you work, I mean, I, I remember years ago when I was a news journalist, we, we did a, a news story on stupid shit that people call dispatch for. <laughs> you know, and in a world where people go, you know, my Wendy's is late. And it's like, yeah, it's not a police matter, ma'am. Um, mm-hmm. <laughs> sorry about that. My pizza's cold. Well, you don't call 911 for that, do you, you crazy shit? Um, so, and I guess if you had a shift all day, I mean, again, I'm not you know, saying, well, you've got to think of these people. But if you've had a whole day of people doing crazy shit like that, and you're at the end of your shift, and you're like, yeah, of course you're in a box, mate. Yeah, of course you are. <laughs> oh, oh, you're in a Mac. Oh, a truck. Yeah, oh, okay, sure. Mm, really believe. You know, you're not, you're, you're kind of, you know, your, your bullshit tolerance is possibly going to be quite low. Uh, one thing I did like, though, was he didn't start with a, with a full battery. Yeah. Which mm-hmm. I thought was great. So, you know, great advert for Blackberries there. Miss Blackberries. Um, <laughs> obviously, their battery retention is pretty good. And even when it seemed to be running out of energy, it was like, oh, shit, I've got one bit left again. Brilliant. So um, <laughs> nice product placement for Blackberry if you ever happen to find yourself in Iraq buried six foot under the ground in a wooden box. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Ben, do we want to get into our good, bad, weird since we're already talking about the movie? Yeah, let's start with uh, who won this movie for y'all. Well, we already kind of talked about it, but I'm going to go with the director of photography slash the lighting because I felt like the way things were shot made the universe of this coffin, of this box, a lot more substantial than I expected from a movie called Buried. And I found out that he's buried literally in a box and can't get out. And... Even taking the time to watch later how they actually filmed some of this and how they moved parts of the box and they positioned Ryan Reynolds inside the coffin, it just made me love the decision making and how they went through this process. It it was just so interesting and something I'd never seen before. So I'm going to say director of photography. It's a good pick. I, I especially like the way that they use so many different natural light sources that it kind of gave a different glow to the coffin. And it actually felt like it was almost a different set each time. Like you had the the blue of the cell phone, the the orangish yellow of the flashlight, the the lighter with the with the reddish orange. It was just a really cool way of doing that. Dylan, winner. If you're gonna do a movie where you only have one person on screen, they better be do be a damn good actor to keep your attention. So I think Ryan Reynolds just won this for me. Like Simon was mentioning, you know, he was trying to kind of break out of the shell of the rom-com or the goofy uh, Van Wilder sex comedy type stuff and try to show that he was something serious. And uh, I think he showed that with, with this, you know, it may not have been seen by everybody, but I thought he did a pretty uh, damn good job. uh, And, you need somebody to have that kind of dramatic weight to to pull a movie through that full 90 minutes. Yeah, Dylan, I'm going to piggyback off of you because I had Ryan Reynolds also as my winner of this. And there's a lot of people out there who say Ryan Reynolds can only play one character. And I think this is the movie you drop in their laps when they say that, because this is an outstanding and riveting performance without it being physical. Like, there's, there's a little bit of physicality in the performance, but when you're confined to that space, it's a lot more just inflection, facial expression, and he, he just knocked it out of the park with this one. I'm, I'm, I'm going to agree with, with all of you, actually. I think they're all really, really good points. Um, she can't uh, agree with everyone. <laughs> I will just I will just sit on the fence. Mm, it's so comfy. <laughs> <laughs> but I think also I, I want to just I want to give some kudos to um, the guy who wrote the movie, uh, Chris Sparling, um, who, you know, he hadn't really done a huge amount and a lot of the stuff beforehand. You know, he'd done a movie called um, An Uzi at the Alamo and he'd done uh, not long after this, there was a movie called ATM, which was like a thriller set around an ATM. Uh, didn't exactly make money at the box office, ironically. <laughs> but he's gone on to write, uh, you know, perhaps this year's most Oscar snubbed movie, uh, Greenland, um, the uh, the Gerard <laughs> Butler movie, which again, you know, good old Jerry. Um, if you're looking for something with uh, overwrought dialogue, it's uh, good old Jerry Butler. Um, so he wrote Greenland, but he's done a few other movies actually, like Sea of Trees, which had a very, very good script. 
But I think for the fact that he had, you don't, you only have people outside the box and Ryan in the box and to just have something that had substance that wasn't a guy in a box freaking out, but to write in stuff like the, uh, the complete anus um, who was fundamentally HR. I mean, getting a call from HR, oh you know, human God. resources at any point of the day is never fun. <laughs> but the fact that you're going, it's like if anybody says, hey, I'm from HR, can we have a chat? The answer's fuck off. You know, because it's <laughs> never going to be good. And when they go, I'm here to help you, no, you're not. What are you talking about? <laughs> you're HR. You're not working in my favor. So the fact that, you know, they had Stephen um, Tobolowski uh, being this guy, Alan Davenport, um, from HR at the other end of the line. It's like, two things couldn't get worse. You've had a snake trying to bite your dick off. You're in a box. <laughs> You've almost set fire to yourself. You're probably pissed your pants. And then HR call. Uh, not a great day. <laughs> I think to the fact that there was all that in there, and the tension and the levity, and the fact that Ryan didn't really run out of things to say, it didn't get samey. For me, I think we have to give some kudos to, to Chris Sparling as well on that. Mm-hmm. Um, and also, I mean, I guess if, if Tobolowski wants to get a job in HR, I mean, nail that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but just, just be warned. What an ass. <laughs> yeah, what a massive ass. And if he's like, can I record this conversation? It's probably not good. Well, let's keep going with the things that we really liked about this movie. Give me some more good. I feel like the director did a phenomenal job. And I I guess I always have like a hard time understanding what the director actually does unless I see what a director is doing. So Simon, Ben and I have a background in theater because we used to do shows together for our students. And so like I've seen Ben directing or I've helped assistant direct or I've seen other people direct. And so I can have an appreciation when I know what they're actually doing. Still haven't quite figured out for movies. So when I was watching some of the behind the scenes stuff and I was watching the director, Rodrigo Cortez, just maneuver people and make plans with people, it just seemed so excellent, just everything he was doing. And I I think he made a lot of good decisions with the movie. I do have a lot of qualms with the movie in general, but I don't know if it's fully his fault. So, But I, I still think he did a phenomenal job. I got to give it up for the uh, sound editing and the sound design. Uh, even just watching it in my living room on my TV, I could tell, oh yeah, watching this in a, um, in a movie theater would have been pretty impressive. You know, a nice dark movie theater and hearing just the sounds the wood knocking and all that all around me just would have probably freaked me the hell out, you know, and just the when the sound mixer is the second build in the opening credits, you know, you're in for an auditory experience. Like that's that I've never seen. I've never seen sound that high up on the list before. I'll tell you what though, hair, hair and makeup and costuming got fucked on this one, didn't they? Cause uh, he literally wore the same things and uh, then we could see his hair. <laughs> yeah, sound design on this is absolutely incredible. Um, I, I also want to give kudos to um, to the throwback Blackberry, which I'll mention again, um, and reminding us exactly how shit cell phone video was um, <laughs> right. 10 years ago. Uh, I mean, terrible. Um, I was impressed, though, that uh, that he could send it from underground. So I don't I know, maybe know. he's on... Maybe he's on Mint Mobile. Maybe that was where the idea <laughs> came yep. for Ryan. He was like, look, I want to create a network where if you're six foot under the ground in a box in Iraq and you've got your BlackBerry, um, you know, you can't use Messenger anymore. Unfortunately, you can't get backup service on that. So don't, don't, call, don't call service for that. Um, but, you know, you can send videos, which is quite good, even if they are people being shot. Well, you, you never know, Simon. They may have, they never pulled back from where he was buried. They could have buried him right underneath the cell tower, and uh, he would have been getting great reception then. <laughs> that is a that is a really good point, actually. That is a really good point. Iraq is known for their great cell coverage. Yeah, <laughs> it's one of their many things. Their rich culture of food and all other things and art and cell phone coverage. Well, I want to call out the twist at the end because even though I didn't really like this movie, I I have to acknowledge that that twist was a great little, once the knife's in the back, a great twist of the knife with the Mark white twist, Mm -hmm. just being able to go and experience that with, with the Ryan Reynolds character where it's like, he's given up hope. 
oh my God, there's a little bit of hope. Nope, the hope is gone. Like it was just a, it was a roller coaster ride of a twist and I liked it a lot. And that, that, that also kind of made me think about the whole, how I said it first, are the terrorists just screwing with him this whole time, you know, with, with fake people talking to him and like, yeah, we're going to get you. We're coming to get you. And it almost would have been like, not a good, it wouldn't have been a good ending if they would have like dropped the accents and like started saying, ha ha, we got you bye, And then click. Yeah. That would have been a terrible movie, Dylan. I mean, oh, shut up. you couldn't have thought they were still fake after shooting his girlfriend in the face. No. Yeah. Okay. True. Hang on. Know. Hang on. Hang on. I don't think they were fucking. So oh, I fuck off. <laughs> like I seriously, like I, I tend to believe the protagonist when they're defending themselves. When there's literally only one character on screen. No, at that point, he was just trying to make sure that his family got the, the money for his death. That's all he was go- shooting for at that point. Whatever. Yep. I was just about to say that, Ben. I was like, yeah, all he was doing was just talking about, no, 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 no. We were just friends. We were just friends as he's being fired and told, oh, yeah, by the way, since you're going to die, your par- your family is not going to ben- get any of the benefits of uh, your contract whatsoever. Yeah. Well, fucking admin. <laughs> it's like I didn't I didn't get laid and now there's all the admin so that's doubly frustrating <laughs> terrible 90 minutes <laughs> yeah and there's no one to see him when he gets out well I mean not that he does get out obviously spoiler Bummer. um I I with the ending one thing I that, that I did think was was potentially that actually they were buried like side by side but they just didn't get to him and that mm. was me Ooh, oh. yeah. Maybe they were maybe they were setting it up for a sequel, where in fact, um, you know, there was another there was another bit, uh, just a short, where uh, reburied, where they, uh, <laughs> they do, do get to him. They rebury Mark White, and then they find dead Ryan Reynolds. <laughs> yeah, buried two six feet deeper. <laughs> <laughs> Writes down. Sells idea to Hollywood. <laughs> yes. yeah. Can we get to all the shit I hated about this movie? Yeah, let's do it. Let's talk about the bad. Okay, right from the beginning, the opening credits. I know that some people may like the design, but I was like, all right, let's make this fucking allegory just be obvious and hit you in the face. We are getting buried. It was so, so obnoxious to me, and I don't know why. I don't understand the length. Why, why, when you only have Ryan Reynolds, are you going to do a, a two minute opening credit scroll? Like, just got to build attention. Give me Ryan Reynolds buried, put me in the coffin. I'm ready. Mm-hmm. Put you in the coffin with Ryan Reynolds. You know, I'm up for that. I've already eyebrows, said that multiple eyebrows, times. Eyebrows? Yeah. That, and I would, I, I would say that the opening credits and the closing credits felt really kind of cartoony and. Uh, like you know, you had an animated opening, and then the the end song was like this kind of like ah shucky shucks, depression esque you know sounding song from like oh brother where art thou type thing, and I was like this doesn't fit with the movie. But um, one more thing uh, I want to the one thing I really didn't like was I didn't like that this movie had a score. That was my big. I didn't mind that. Because the opening score did sound like, you know, North by Northwest or um, like a big uh, Hitchcock opening credit sequence. It did sound like that. It reminded me of Men in Black, to be honest with you, Dylan. A mm, little bit. Yeah, I can see that. But um, I just thought like it, the movie would have benefited so much with crank up that sound, that that sound design of everything happening and the movement and everything and just do no score like dog day afternoon or alfred hitchcock's rope rope had no soundtrack you know after after the opening credits there's no there's no score to it it's just the ambient noise that's there so i think that would have made it much more tense uh feeling to like not have a score there because the score makes it sound like a movie I think the places that it probably could have used the score, though, are the parts where it gets a little fantastical, you know, when we have that crane shot pulling up or when he's kind of just sitting there 
unmoving and things kind of slow down a little bit. I, I could see that being places for music. But I was going to say, Dylan, I agree with you. I didn't like the song at the end. And I feel really bad about it because I was reading about it and the director definitely helped write it and helped sing. And they did it and came up with the song in like a couple hours right before everything was due. It's just that it felt a little bit New Orleans-y Mardi Gras with some of the brass. And it just took me right out of the movie. So that was a little bit more of a weird for me. And I get kind of what they were trying to do, but it just didn't fit. And I know that Bob Dylan was too expensive for them, but they probably should have done something a little bit different. Mm -hmm. I think for me, the one thing that I didn't, that, that kind of, you know, stuck in my craw a bit was there was a, a slow down montage with the heartbeat. Yes. And that, that kind of felt a little bit hokey for me. That was, you know, a little bit music video and a little bit like, oh, this is the thing that's, and I just, it didn't fit with the, almost the natural drama of everything else. Um, that, that felt a little bit off for me. All of those Specifically, are, are really you're talking about the scene right after he sees the woman get shot. Right. And it, it's yeah. him like throwing up into the coffin. And yeah, I, I completely agree with you. Yeah. And he's kind of spinning out. Like yep. The other one that really took me out of it was the, the fake out save. I didn't like that because it happened so fast and they cut back to him so quickly that there wasn't even enough time for you to like register, like what it would mean for him to be saved. Like it was just mm -hmm. like yeah. bright light saved. Oh, we're back. He's in the coffin. It's like, I legit that was laughed way at too that. fast. Yeah. I'm not a good person. <laughs> I was going to say, uh, unlike, uh, what was it, 1408, Ben, where it's like the 10 minutes of him thinking he was rescued and then he ends up right back in the hotel room. Mm -hmm. I mean, that was super obnoxious, but sure. <laughs> that was going too far. This was too short. That was too medium. long. They should yeah. have, find something in the middle. Okay, I've been saving up my weird this whole time oh, and I want to talk I? about it so badly. All right, I have one more. I have one more kind of okay. Bad. Keep going bad. Keep going bad. I did not like the uh, gentleman the who played Dan Brenner, the the kind of hostage negotiator guy. And my what? only reasoning here was my only reasoning. I don't think I didn't think he was the strongest actor in it, um, especially when you have Stephen Tobolowsky, who is an amazing character actor. I, I thought they could have gone with, you know, you had $2 million. You couldn't maybe put a little bit more towards getting a, a little stronger voice talent there. That's that's just me. You know, again, it's one of those things where if you're trying to convince me that this guy's stuck in a box and everything, you got to get some good voice talent along with it, too. So I was very convinced he was stuck in a box. I would have loved that to have been played by Gilbert Gottfried. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> What? You're stuck in a what? I'm with the FBI. Or, or yeah, or Har Harvey Feierstein or someone. Yeah. Oh, jeez. Yay! <laughs> For me, this movie, generally, I liked it. But I think partially because I am in the weird millennial generation that's younger than Dylan and Ben significantly. Um, but oh. I, <laughs> I'm sorry, guys. I am. <laughs> we all know this. I'm not 30. <laughs> I think that growing up with the Iraq conflict and being surrounded in the media and being surrounded with a lot of the hate in the world for Muslims and anyone that look different or, or not white, essentially, I, I struggled having to watch another idea like this. And not saying that I've seen a ton of Middle Eastern drama war movies, but it just felt seeing it for the first time like this was not my type of thing. I've never really been a big fan of these kinds of movies when it comes to, hey, we're going to have the bad guy be brown people that and I know that this movie really tried to focus in on how the, these these enemies, quote unquote, have depth. They're criminals because they have to be because Americans have destroyed their families, their homes, their jobs, everything. But it just still seemed so like focused on Ryan Reynolds, where that was just such a throwaway. And and that was the most uncomfortable I've I was in this movie. 
it made me feel like a shitty American, <laughs> like honestly. And I think that that's partially the point, but it still felt like it could have been explored a little bit more rather than this full 90 minutes on Ryan Reynolds. And maybe that's not the point, but it still just felt like a, let's just throw this on tap and brush over it. I, I, I would say, Emily, I, I agree with you. And I think actually you, you, you know, you, you put that really well, but I think Thanks, also, it felt like shit. <laughs> no, no, I think you put it really well. It's, it's, it's very difficult to sort of be very specific about, you know, some of these things sometimes, but I think also on, on that same tip, the fact that obviously, you know, this was kind of a one dimensional way to, to look at, you know, the, the, these people are seen as the bad guys, but also there's then the other side, the fact that they are looking at Ryan Reynolds as this American. It's it's a different kind of almost like putting each other in boxes, for want of a better phrase. And it's mm-hmm. judging very much on one person is therefore weird. And I, I find when I talk about things like, you know, this and, and you know, and, and racism, when people hate certain things in life is like, just assuming that, you know, we, 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 you know, some people say, I don't like people of color, or I don't like gay people or whatever. And it's kind of like going, you you take your hate you you take your hatred of one thing and you put it out to everybody. But we never say met a guy called Brian once and he was a dick. So I don't like anyone <laughs> called Brian. Do you know what I mean? It, Teachers and, and have that problem. <laughs> yeah, but it's 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 sometimes this thing where it's you know we do, and I think this is very much yes, I absolutely agree with what you're saying. But I think it's also kind of a good example of putting people in in a box. Ryan's literally in a box, but this guy's opinion of you know, Americans is this thing and Ryan's not that thing. He's a truck driver. And then everybody else's view of the fact that this guy, he's a terrorist. But, you know, yes, he may be a terrorist, but also the reason that he's doing this is because of his family while Ryan's trying to get money for his family. So you are absolutely right. And I think you allocated that really, really well. But I think there's kind of, there's almost like a mirror there somehow on that one. Right. No, it's absolutely a fair point, especially for something in 2010 being as in-depth as this is especially as we're getting more commentaries on race and different perspectives today in 2022 now there's stuff out there to counter it you know whereas in 2010 there was much less of that okay ben can it's i talk time. about it yes, yes you can. okay the fucking snake <laughs> god damn it yeah. I so the way that the way that they did the snake and revealed it it looked like it started from his crotch so it doesn't show like him reacting to the snake going up his pant. Like all it does is show it going down his pant, like which just makes it look like his dick is just getting bigger and bigger as it goes down his pant leg. <laughs> but, and then it, the whole, yeah, the whole snake sequence took me completely out of the movie. I, I didn't fully recover after that point. Cause I was like, I have so many questions about the snake and you're just going to have him slither away. And we never talk about it again. I, I didn't like that. It was too, it, it it totally took me out of the movie. You know what? It almost it almost felt kind of like Ben. Now that you're kind of talking about it, and I'm thinking about it again, it almost seems like they were, you know, when they were writing the script, they're like, "All right, we're about a page or two down. We gotta we gotta think of one other thing for him to something to happen to him. What's what's something? Uh, a snake? Yeah, yeah, a snake. We'll have that. Or you know, or they just, or maybe even the producers told him. You know, you got to add something more to this to to give it a little extra scare factor or something like that. And they were like, how about a snake gets in there with him? And so he's got to try to get away from it. How do you get away from a snake when you're in a box? You start a fire in the confined space you're in. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly, yeah, you start a fire in a combustible wooden box. <laughs> right. Yeah, I had issues with the snake, but it was more, I felt like, the snake itself was just minding its own business. It's just hanging out. It was real cute. Just, you know, slithering around, sticking its tongue out. And then fucking Ryan Reynolds throws some alcohol at it. It's like, shit, what are you doing? Then burns the hell out of it. This is it's unnecessary. The snake would have just been his buddy. Like, come on. <laughs> yeah, that's one thing where I'll give the sound design a thumbs down. Because, like, the, the sound of the snake, how it was kind of like this, like... <laughs> odd like a rattlesnakey sound i was like it doesn't sound like that snake what what the i've never heard a a, a snake sound like that well it didn't sound real all i could hear is jafar and aladdin 
Let's see how snake-like I can be. <laughs> okay. That's all I can hear now. I'm sorry. One thing I hated about the snake. Yeah, I mean, I was like, where the fuck did the snake come from? <laughs> um, but it was the fact that when the snake gave Ryan Reynolds stink eye, like he was like, <laughs> oh, you bitch. I was like, I don't, it was kind of like, I don't think snakes just get like, I think they just get pissed off when they do snake shit. I don't think they sort of, you know, go, mm, you're an asshole, Ryan. Um, <laughs> Is that Ryan to be honest with you, for a, for a, Yeah. <laughs> <He's> like, <laughs> what? Um, yeah. But I, I have to say, for someone who's Canadian, Ryan Reynolds gets to play a lot of asshole Americans. I, I kind of feel sorry for the guy. Yeah. So, but yeah, the, the snake, uh, the snake I'm, I'm sure, is somewhere in, you know, in, a, in a snake acting class, you know, saying... Yeah, I did this great movie with Ryan Reynolds in a box. Uh, you should see me give him the stink eye. No, you could tell he comes from a family of of screen snakes. Like his grandparents were definitely in Temple of Doom. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Honestly, I see a bunch of snakes right now in in a class, and he's going, Now when I met Ryan Reynolds, and just there's a bunch of people a bunch of snakes in the back going, Oh, for fuck's sake, he's talking about the goddamn buried again nobody's seen buried <laughs> nobody's seen buried steve what it's my best movie let me tell you about the time that my grandfather taught jafar how to make a snake sound <laughs> any other weird yeah i mean okay so as a math teacher i was really taken out of the movie because i was trying to reason through and calculate the amount of oxygen he had left especially as he was panicking and then when he was taking ant anxiety meds how that would affect his oxygen levels and then also him using fire using up the oxygen it just it really took me out which i know i really shouldn't have that's my own fucking fault but that really bothered me and i know that there was a realistic time limit because when i actually looked it up and figured out exactly how much air would be in a normal size coffin it, it would have been at least five and a half hours. And so I'm like, okay, reasonable, but also he's really fucking this up. So I uh, was, was struggling with that emotionally and mentally as a math teacher. But can I say, Emily, I, I, I fucking love that. <laughs> really? <laughs> I, I genuinely love that. Well, he's also making that. carbon dioxide while he's like lighting fires, you know? I'm like, you idiot. <laughs> yeah. It's lucky he didn't fart though, to be honest with you. Or well, maybe that would have saved him. <laughs> Explode him out of there! Yeah. Science, science, right there. Simon, anything else stick out for you? I mean, no, not really. To be honest with you, I, I, I think I think we've sort of covered everything that that would be annoying because I, I think there's so there's so much that goes on, but there's also so little that goes on in True. the movie. Mm -hmm. um, and I think you know because of that, there's probably way more for me that I think they did right done those things that that would annoy the only thing i think that i i didn't mention that was annoying was similar to you emily with the, with the whole working out the oxygen and stuff like that was a lot of a lot of sand got in there very quickly mm -hmm. yeah you know and he was surrounded by sand very very quickly and there was the only the hole in the top i mean unless that fucking snake was shoveling it in through the side, oh that fucking you know? snake did it oh, that that's why the snake ryan's that asshole snake <laughs> who's there you know, shoveling sand in. He's like, I'll teach you, wasting that alcohol, giving his stink eye. <laughs> but yeah, there was there was there was a lot of dirt in there very quickly, um, and I was a bit like, eh, I don't know, I don't buy that so much. Not that I'm a dirt expert, but or a maths teacher, but I'm going to call <laughs> bullshit on that. Well, also coming coming from one hole, like you see, when you have an hourglass that like mounds up, that's what should have happened. There should have been at least some part of that coffin that he would have been able to have his full head in. Granted, there's less oxygen there, but it shouldn't have been him fully like under sand by the end of it. Well, let, let's put a cork in this thing, and we are going to start with Dylan. Dylan, give me your final thoughts on Buried. Uh, final thoughts. Uh, again, I thought this was, uh, I went in kind of with some underwhelming thoughts with the uh, opening and everything. But after, uh, once we got really into it, I, I enjoyed the movie and it was, it was good. I liked it. Emily. This isn't really an Emily movie, 
<laughs> Although I still admire a lot of the techniques in filmmaking that were used to create it. And therefore, I liked it more than I expected. Simon? Um, I mean, it's certainly if you want to impress Ryan Reynolds and, you know, and, and stop him, if you ever see him out in public, tell him that you love Buried and he'd probably stop and go, <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, because he probably doesn't get that a lot. But I think, honestly, it's one of those movies where we do get to see, you know, Ryan doing a bit more than certainly he was doing at the time, which is quite interesting. And there's there's not a lot of movies out there that are kind of like this, really. Um so I think it's it's a really good gateway movie for, you know, seeing what else Ryan Reynolds can do and, you know, it's then getting on to explore things like Hitchcock. I think it serves a purpose in that. I think it's flawed, but I think, you know, as we were saying earlier, there are so many things to it that if you're looking to to study sort of, you know, how things are done in cinema, it's a really good example. They use a lot of really good tricks really effectively here. But obviously, if you're a snake, you're probably going to be disappointed. But if you work for for for, for BlackBerry, you'll be delighted. And if you work in HR... <laughs> Um, probably not your best look, um, but it's a good movie. I mean, you know, there are worse Ryan Reynolds movies out there, um, but there, you know, there are certainly better ones. Um, but you know, at least it's not Green Lantern, um, and it's <laughs> it's not a waste of ninety minutes. And if you don't like it, it's only ninety minutes. Mm-hmm. Uh, Simon, I'm glad you brought up it not being like other movies because my review is I liked this movie better when it was phone booth. Ouch. <laughs> Ouch. <laughs> I'm assuming this is a guy stuck in a phone booth. And it's not Superman? Yeah, it's uh, it's Kiefer Sutherland holding a guy hostage in a phone booth. Oh, my God. Colin Farrell's in it. Okay, yep. I might have to watch He's this He's the guy now. stuck in the phone booth. <laughs> it's got a prostitute shouting, you done wrecked my dick hand, which is yes. one of the greatest lines in cinema history. <laughs> that line bought somebody a house in the Hollywood Hills. Right? <laughs> Hey, Steve, how did you afford this house? Well, I wrote a line many years ago about <laughs> ruining a prostitute's dick hand, and here we are in Bel Air. What's your favorite idea? Mine is being creative. How do you get that idea? I just tried to think creatively. So, Simon, we're going to play a little bit of some Battle of Twits Light. In the past, we've done prep of some creative and silly answers to questions that are somewhat related to the movie. We'll say inspired by. So rules of this semi game is just say whatever is the first thing that comes into your mind. You seem pretty good at that already. So no (laughs) concerns here. I don't know whether that's a compliment or not. but uh, (laughs) Yes. Number one, we're going to play. You've been buried alive which is a game similar to you're stuck on a deserted island. So what three things are you bringing with you to be buried alive? Well, on such an optimistic note, um, <laughs> I would I would probably take some uh, TP. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. Uh, you know, you've got you to have, have that TP. Um, oh, what would I take? I would take my, uh, uh, my self-loathing and regret. Um, <laughs> I, I would I would take that uh, in there um, and uh, I'd probably take a, some music I would take god what would I take no I'd take I'd take a DVD of Paul Blart Mall Cop or Grown Ups <laughs> um, just so that the prospect that I was dying in a box wasn't the worst thing that had happened to me that day <laughs> Um, it was watching either of those movies. Um, you know, cheer myself up a bit. So I hope that answers that question. Ben? Oxygen tank, number one. Gotta have my oxygen oh, tank with me. Yep. And then since I'm going to be there a while, portable DVD player filled with Hook, so I can watch Hook multiple times. <laughs> That's obvious. And then, I, I don't know, are there any animals that, like, eat sand? Not snakes. Nope, snakes, snakes don't. <laughs> <laughs> they useless at it. But yeah, something something that would dissolve sand so I can get out eventually, but not dissolve my, my skin. Mm. Yeah, I don't think you're going to find something like that. I think you have to imagine and create something like that. Unless you get something hot enough to burn it into glass, but that seems like that would I also mean, don't, not be don't helpful. Don't those, like, those dune snakes, don't they eat sand a little bit or like tremors? <laughs> okay, sure. <laughs> get okay. a fantastical beast to eat the sand. <clears throat> there you go. Yes, that's what I want. Yeah. Dylan. 
some kind of a snack. So let's say uh, like a big bag of popcorn, like a movie theater bag of popcorn, like the uh, garbage bag of popcorn. Last you a very long yep. time. Oh, I'm going to chow down. The end of the night garbage bag that, you know, you, you have to fill up the, the yep. empty popcorn. When all the people yeah. want their free <laughs> refills, you know, you got that extra bag of popcorn. I'm taking that with me. That's right. Probably, uh, uh, <laughs> probably a book. I'd probably take the uh, a Brandon Sanderson Twilight Archives <laughs> book because they're all like 1,500 pages long. So it'd be something nice and long to read while I was under there. And then, of course, some kind of a light source. I'd probably I'd probably ask for my iPhone because then I could have it for multiple purposes. I could use it as a flashlight or listen to some music or watch a movie. No service with an iPhone. <laughs> Not six feet. Should under. be on mint. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> well, I just got the really good iPhone that's like filled. That's like a full like terabyte. So I got stuff downloaded on that thing. Wow. Okay, you could download well. uh, some games and play Snake. <laughs> <laughs> Show a snake what it's really supposed to be doing. Number two. What am I holding for ransom that you would pay a million dollars for? Ooh. Naked Ryan Reynolds. <laughs> <laughs> good, it's the not obvious that. choice. <laughs> I'll write you a check. Yeah. Here, let's go. Yeah. <laughs> Was that your actual checkbook? Yeah, it was. Fuck? I don't know why it's on my table. <laughs> Good prop. <laughs> yeah. Dylan? What would I pay a million dollars for that's not sentimental? Not your children? Where, yeah, that Emily's not going to go, oh, that's a stupid answer, Dylan. Your kids. That's fine. Ugh. You can be sentimental. Oh, my mom. <laughs> God damn it. Um... <laughs> Oh, I'd probably pay a million dollars for um, if somebody could find some of the uh, embarrassing college photos that are out there in the uh, the ether of the Internet. There's there's some couple oh. shots. Yeah, there are some prize shots that are uh, of me very, very drunk at the Rocky Horror Picture Show uh, <gasps> that are not me at my best light. OK, I want to find these now. Not for the million dollars, literally just to enjoy them. Simon, you got anything? Uh, a million dollars. Probably a member of my family. <laughs> uh, or my Blu-ray of The Twilight Zone would probably. <laughs> <laughs> Love Pretty it. Pretty proud of that one. The, the movie The Twilight Zone or? The movie The Twilight Zone. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, pretty rare. Pretty rare. And the I'm a Vic very Morrow sad man. classic. Number three. Please give me an alternative discovery when Dan is talking to Paul at the end and he says, Oh no, I'm so sorry, Paul. It's Mark White, but instead of Mark White, fill in the blank. What did he actually discover? I'm gonna go with uh Zendaya is Michi. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's good. Okay. Well, thank that's you. good. Thank you. I'm an idiot, but thank you. <laughs> we love idiots here. Honestly, the first thing that popped into my head was uh they finally found Jimmy Hoffa's body and that's where he was buried. Oh. I don't know who that is. God damn it. Who do I know in the world? <laughs> You should know who Jimmy Hoffa was, because that was pretty scandalous. He died before I was born. Same here, but at least I know who Jimmy Hoffa is. You got an idea? Yeah, I think he finds the Ark of the Covenant, and right <laughs> be right after that, his like face melts. That's why Paul dies. Yeah. Well, no, not, no, Dan. That's how no. Dan dies. No, 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 Dan dies too, but that's how I Paul dies too. <laughs> That's what that really bright light was. That wasn't actually, that wasn't actually a dream. That was a, 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 a vision of the future. Say, we we find out that Dan was the uh, Nazi, the Nazi in like the black leather coat. <laughs> that was really him. <laughs> okay, yeah, love it. Now let's all agree to never be creative again. Time for a game. Yep, I made a game for us today. Shall we play a game? I despise guessing games. I have this great game. 
makes you think and helps you memory. Let the games begin. Everyone gets to play, and you're all on the same team today. Oh. So it's a, it's a little different. This game is called Buried. Okay. Okay. And Clever. in this game, I'm going to give you a description of a person whose name is Barry, and you have to tell me their last name. So these oh, are all no. famous Barrys. <laughs> and I'm going to just a little one line description and you give me the last name and whoever, you know, you're all on the same team. So you can talk about it if you get stuck. OK, and away we go. Director of Moonlight. Oh, uh, Jenkins, Barry Jenkins. Correct. Starred with Tom Hanks in Saving Private Ryan and the Green Mile. Barry Pepper. Barry Pepper, Barry Pepper yes. Steroid using baseball player. Barry Bonds. Correct. Singer of the song, Can't Get Enough of Your Love, Baby. Barry White. Barry White. Barry White. Hey, Barry White, that's correct. I got one. Director of Men in Black. Barry Levinson. No, Barry no, Sonnenfeld. Sonnenfeld. Sonnenfeld, correct. Played Brad in Rocky Horror. Oh, God. Oh. Barry Bostwick. Correct. Republican presidential nominee in 1964. Barry Goldwater. Correct. Fucking Dylan, you're really a, good at this. Dylan. You know your berries. Member of the Bee Gees. A Barry Bee Gees. Gee? <laughs> Barry Bee <BG>, Gees, yes. <laughs> Director of Rain Man. That was Barry, Barry Levinson. Levinson. That's correct. Running back for the Detroit Lions. Barry Sanders. Correct. Greg Brady on the Brady Bunch. Oh, wow. That Barry Gary. <laughs> Did you just say Barry Brady? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, that one, I don't know. Three, two, one. Barry Williams. God damn it. Star of B-Movie. Barry B. Benson. <laughs> That's right. It all comes back to B-Movie. <laughs> this podcast is full circle. I hate you. That's You guys, 11 out of 12 is really good. I'm surprised you guys did great. I helped with one. On, on, on a B-movie, I once did uh, my impression of Jerry Seinfeld for Jerry Seinfeld. Oh, and, really? and how did he feel about that? You thought it was actually quite good. That's good. Um, yeah. Hey, it's Jerry Seinfeld. What's the deal with bags? It's way better than Matt's. <laughs> <laughs> it's, really, it's good. Thank you. I, I, there, is a, there is a recording somewhere on the internet of it because um, I put it there. <laughs> um, so that's how that's how it works and uh yeah so the great story simon well done everybody <laughs> that's basically the story to the impression recorded it put it on the internet well simon thank you so much for joining us today and hanging out with us and talking about buried is there anything you want to plug before you go um i mean you can follow me on social media um if you if you want um that's a great sell isn't it um <laughs> yeah you can find me on the the, the ridiculous name uh, at showbiz simon on instagram and twitter um i was a very early adopter of twitter and uh, i was a lot younger and i did a lot more entertainment stuff then so i thought showbiz simon would be really good and now i just well you know what it's a little dated um, but I can't change it because I got my blue tick. Um, and as I get older, it just looks more ridiculous. But uh, there you go. Regret's a wonderful thing. Um, so in answer, follow me on social media. Um, and if you want to read the stuff that I write, then um, thank you. The, the thing about that name, though, Simon, is it's going to circle back around eventually. Like it, it was really cool when you were young. It's, it's not so cool now. But when you're like 70 or 80, like showbiz Simon is going to be a throwback and you're going to be cool again. Mm-hmm. Well, I don't know if that's true, but uh, <laughs> I will take that back. Thank you so much. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you, everybody, for listening. Uh, please like, rate, subscribe, share us with a friend or two. Follow us on social media at IDYP underscore podcast on Twitter and Instagram. Or you can email us at idrinkyourpodcast at gmail.com. Emily, what do we got next week? Next week, we will be watching another foreign movie. This is our third one of 2010, yep. I believe. Mm-hmm. And this one is by Yorgos Lanthimos, and it is the Greek film Dogtooth. Yes. So excited to watch that one. And again, Simon, thank you for being here. Before you go, in your best Daniel Day-Lewis impression, 
end the episode by saying, I drink your podcast. I drink it up. I drink your podcast. I drink it up. Phenomenal. For some reason, Beautiful. he appears to get Beautiful. a Hogwarts. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> Fuck that up. Thanks for having me. <laughs> we loved Thank having you. Thanks, yeah. Simon. Bye, everybody. Bye.